afternoon session today. It's a great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Professor Alina Rubinstein Dunlop from the University of Queensland in Australia. Uh, she was uh, one of the organizers for our ICAMP 2010 school when we had it in Australia. It was a very, very successful summer school. Uh, and uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome her as a speaker for this school. So let us welcome Alina. again about optical freezers and I can see people in the audience who have heard them before. So yesterday um, after the dinner, a wonderful dinner, I thought I had this little thought that maybe instead of giving a lecture we could uh, we could have a little discussion going for four hours about optical freezers and that would be something new. Um, uh, and uh, the idea would be something like that. I taught you so much about it before that now I could just pose questions to you. And we have, according to uh, Mazur's, um, Eric Mazur's method, clickers, and we could put question answers up and see how statistically we're doing. And that would be something different. And I thought, oh, what a good idea. Why didn't I think about it before? So unfortunately, I'm not prepared for it. So I will just give you a very boring lecture. <laughs> but if Ivan will invite me next time around or whatever, how many years from now, then I will prepare it and then you'll be in real trouble. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so optical tweezers. So what I want to tell, tell you about, it's a little bit in the same vein as the two previous talks. So we're talking optical forces, scattering, gradient force scattering and absorption, basically. So, but I not only want to organize the particles and make nice little um, structures on the surface, but I also want to I want to trap them three dimensionally. I want to be able to twist them, turn them, and at the same time measure the forces that I'm applying, forces and torques. So, yes, and use them in bio medical application or biological applications. So I'll show you a few examples of that. So, um, yes. So the previous speaker was talking about optical forces. And I want to start from radiation pressure force that you learn about in first year of physics. And of course, radiation, oops, sorry, radiation pressure force can be easily seen, for example, in the tail of the comets. It's very easy to, to, to know or uh, engage in the idea of light carrying energy because it's hot when we stand in the sun and all the rest of it. But momentum is slightly less obvious in everyday life. However, and it's basically because the, the, the radiation pressure force is not this strong, so the momentum transfer is not this strong. So we can observe it in, for example, chaos of a comet. So this is dust particles, a lot of dust particles, and, and the light is being bent away, and the particles are being bent away from, from the light. And I really like this one, so you go to your favorite Google page, and you've got Comet, Radiation Pleasure, and then you see this fantastic uh, uh, photograph. And so we see here not only the, the, the uh, comet tail, the dust, but we see the electrons as well. And because the forces, these forces acting on the electrons are much stronger, then we see that they separate, and uh, we see the radiation pressure. Okay, and the radiation pressure uh, ha has been a very um, um, fascinating subject for a very long time. And a long time ago, Nichols and Hal were trying to measure it. And that was so long ago that the lasers were non existing, and uh, it was a very difficult experiment. So the idea was that you had incident beam of light, you had a mirror, perfectly reflecting mirror, and you had a black disc here and you have all of that suspended on a torsion fiber. And so if we had radiation pressure acting here, then we should see the torsion occurring. So that was very difficult, and uh, the measured radiation pressure is at 5 times 10 to minus 6 meter per meter square. Uh, and then uh, we can calculate a little bit more what sort of uh, forces we are talking about. And if I have 10 milliwatt helium-neon laser, 
and I focus it to the wavelength spot, and I put it on the object of the same diameter with the density of one gram per centimeter to minus two to the third. The, and I assume that the particle is 10% reflected and acts as a flat mirror, then the momentum change of the laser light each second would be 10 to 10, uh, 2 times 10 to minus 3 uh, divided by uh, the speed of light. So if we have conservation of momentum, then we can see that, that it results on the force of 10 to minus 12 meters. So if we estimate the mass of the particle by this little equation here, that gives us acceleration of the particle of 5 times 10 to the fourth meter per second squared. So this is 100 times acceleration due to gravity. So it's pretty interesting. I think it's human phenomenon as it is this one. OK, so let us look what we can do with all this. So I, oops, I take laser, a uh, Gaussian beam, and uh, I shine it on a little particle. And so this is the Gaussian profile. Okay. And there's a particle which is um, to the side of the maximum of intensity of light. So we can see that ray A here is stronger than ray B. And so the force on the sphere is due to refraction of the ray A, it is FA. And to the refraction of the beam B is FB. So we can see that the particle will be drawn to the most intense part of the beam. So it's pulled to the most intense part of the beam. OK. So let's use it. We want to use it for three-dimensional traveling in X, V, and Y, and Z. And this is totally wrong artistic impression of it all. But we're talking about optical tweezers, so this is just an artist's impression that Kishan Dolakia likes using. So basically, this is my light beam, and it's holding a particle. Okay. So let's see what we can do. And, and, and we want to go as far as manipulating single molecules using this sort of stuff. So what do I want to do? I want to take laser light, focus it very, very, very strongly, and be able to use it for tweezing, for scissing, if you wish, cut, catapulting, screw driving, and using it as optical spanner, orange. And more than that, when I turn the things using light, as in using it as an optical spanner, I also want to measure how much I turn. So I want to calculate in all optical way how much, I, uh, I, I, how much torque is being applied. And this is a mechanical device here. When people are playing with their uh, tires, you can actually measure how much torque you apply. So we want to do it in a lot of ways. So basically, what I want to tell you is I want to tell you a little bit about the principles of optical tweezers, and we have heard a little bit about optical forces and dragging forces already in the previous talk. I want to show you a few examples. Then I want to show you how we can make force measurements uh, uh, using uh, Brownian motion and otherwise, and use it for adhesion studies. Um, then I want to go over to not only having transfer of linear angular momentum, but having transfer of um, uh, angular momentum of light, and so uh, impose rotation on the particles. And then again, I want to use it for um, applications such as microbiology in vacuum systems. So in order to do that, I will show you methods of, of measurement of torque, and uh, then I will show you that in order to have this uh, where are we, rotation, I can use spin angular momentum or I could use orbital angular momentum. And then I will show you applications of that uh, uh, as applied to micro machine and micro fluidic devices. Okay, so optical tweezers in the simplest of ways, we can imagine it as I have photons coming to my, to my little object, so the photon will be reflected from, from this object, and now we have force acting on it, which will be, if, if the photon has energy H bar K, then I'll have force acting on it of 2 H bar K. So in the laser, I have many photons. It's microscopic, so we have these small forces. So if I push it through, this is if the particle will behave something like this. What can I do with it? Well, a lot has been done. So the, the whole thing has been developed by Arthur Ashkin 
many, many years ago. And uh, what can we do with it? It's very simple. It combines measurement of forces and theory gives us very powerful tool for all those applications that I listed in the previous page. Um, so, and typically what we are talking about is we have about 10 gigawatt per square meter of power, one micron, uh, micron radius particles. So we're talking about forces of one piconewton per milli, milli watt. So the, there are sophisticated and less sophisticated uh, uh, theories of optical tweezers, and the simplest of them is the ray optics model. And this, of course, assumes, and we have heard it today already from the first speaker, that uh, uh, if I assume that my uh, particle is much larger than the wavelength of light, I can use the ray optics model. Um, and uh, what happens here, I have the rays of light coming onto the particle. The, the focus of the light is um, uh, above the center of this particle. Particle is, um, um, has a higher refractive index than surrounding. So this is, we follow the rays and we can see what happens here. I will have a force acting upwards. So the particle will be drawn to the most intense part of the beam, according to what we said before. If, however, the situation is such that the, the most intense part of the beam is below the particle, by the same token, if we look at the rays being, uh, the forces being created here by the, the refraction of the beam, we can see that the particle will be drawn again into the most intense part of the beam, which means in Z direction downwards. And of course, the same situation will occur to the left and to the right. And so altogether, we have uh, manipulation of the particle uh, in three dimensions. So force is a uh, result from the exchange of momentum of the, of the beam. Now, if the particle is a little tiny dipole, much smaller than the wavelength of light, we can treat it as a force on a dipole, and this is the situation here. So we have the minimum energy state will be at the very center of this beam, of the, in the most in part, uh, intense part of the beam. So if I move the beam around, obviously the particle will follow the most intense part of the beam. Okay, so I can look at the optical forces that we apply here. Uh, and so the force here will be given by the refractive index of the trapped particle, incident power of, of the laser light, uh, divided by the speed of light times some sort of efficiency factor uh, for this process. Uh, if I am in a solution, what will also happen is that I have drag force acting on this particle, which is given by this equation, it's just Stokes drag which is uh, proportional to the viscosity of the, of the liquid uh, and, and proportional to the size of the particle and the maximum velocity. And so if I want to now calculate, calculate the uh, transverse efficiency factor, uh, I can equate these forces to each other and this will be the expression for it. So it, I, have, I can study a lot of things by looking at this type of forces. Okay, and uh, the setups for, for this sort of uh, optical tweezers is very simple. We have highly focused laser light, so I take my laser light, I shape it a little bit to overfill the objective slightly, and then I put it through the high numerical objective, uh, numerical objective uh, lens, and I have my sample on the microscope stage, and then I can look at the reflected light or at the transmitted light. So a little setup here. So sort of mechano setup, you can incorporate it into normal microscope, obviously, and a lot of people do that. We like building stuff, so here's the laser out of the page, and then there's the microscope objective, and a and, and few other bits and pieces around it, and we build our optical tweezers. <coughs> okay, so uh, when we can trap and manipulate high index particles in the water. Okay, and then we can start adding things to it, for example, we can get, so normally laser light is linearly polarized. We can now change it to being circularly polarized by adding lambda over four plate here. And then we can add little holograms or use um, uh, SLMs for uh, producing different types of beams which I'll be talking about. So for example, if we use a hologram like that, which is drawn here, we can produce gauss levy beams of light, which are beams of light which carry orbital angular momentum and the characteristic of it is that by, by shaping it in different ways, I, the, such beams can carry one, two, three, hundred h-bar 
of water one millimeter. Uh, and as I said, we can either look in the transmitted light or we can detect all, uh, sorry, in the reflected light or we can detect all the transmitted light. And uh, then we can start playing with little holograms, not only in the outside beam, which would be here, but uh, on the microscope slide, which I will show you an uh, example of. I don't know if I use this slide. Okay. So optical trapping again, and to summarize what we just said, I have a beam of light coming in, I have delta P here acting on it, and then uh, it will be pushed uh, to maintain the, to conserve the momentum, so it's pushed to the middle of the beam. Now I take the highly uh, focused beam, and so the particle not only is pushed toward, uh, in a given direction, but it moves towards the focal spot, so it will always end up in the most intense part of the beam. So here we go. Okay. And bang, it goes to the middle of the beam. Okay, so first example here of the particle. Uh, so what we are doing here is we moving the stage in xy direction, and you can see that the particle here is trapped, uh, while the other particles are free. You can see that all of them jiggle with ground and motion. Even the trap particle, if the trap is not very strong, you can see that it jiggles, experiences ground motion. And sometimes particle will kick out another one which sits there. Sometimes you are even can trap two particles in the same spot. And here we go, they all drop to the middle of the beam. So it's pretty strong trapping here. You can also manipulate laser beam. So now I, I move one of the mirrors in the setup and, and I drive the mirror in x and y direction as you can see here. We go in y and we we'll go x as well. And you can see that the particle is pretty strongly trapped. And obviously this is done, this is a little jerky movements because we're doing it by hand, but you can motorize your mirror and move it to your liking. Okay, so that's optical tweezers. And then we can take and manipulate things inside the cell. So we have piece of dirt in the cell. <coughs> to start with, we thought we had an organelle, but my biology friends told me that this is just a piece of dirt that the cell has absorbed. And, but what we are showing here is basically that I can take this piece of dirt and move it around the living cell and put it, deposit it wherever I want. So in principle, you can take organelles if you know how the organelle is supposed to look like and, and move it around. <laughs> Okay, so uh, let's continue. So, um, stiffness of the trap, we can look at the dynamics of the trap, so it's very easy to model the trap as a harmonic potential. So here's my particle, and it's jiggling around with brain in motion, and I can make this uh, trap stronger or weaker, I can open it up, close it, close it down a bit, and, and I have my um, potential here. And as I showed you, whoops, as I showed you, this is what happens in the trap. Okay? So this is what we observe. So this is my potential here, and the particle is moving with ground in motion. And I can measure that ground in motion, obviously. So I'm following the particle in the trap, and I can look at the, uh, at the power spectrum of this particle. And this is characteristic power spectrum. And by studying it in details, we can then establish uh, trap stiffness. And obviously, for a biological application, we want a very soft trap, and we can achieve that very easily. Okay, so typical setup for force measurement. So I have my uh, I have my neodymium nucleic laser or infrared laser of some sort, whatever it needs to be. I have a set of mirrors and lenses here. I direct it to the uh, microscope objective, and then I can look at the transmitted. Uh, I can I, ha I can have uh, um, illumination in the microscope here, and I can have my CCD camera on top to be able to observe it. I can also introduce Heaney laser here uh, and combine it to follow the the infrared laser, and we do it in order to be able to look at the uh, sorry uh, to be able to look at the position. Um, of the particle in greatest possible details. So basically, I follow the, the Heaney laser in such a way that I put, I look at the transmitted light now, 
and I put it on quadrant photo detector and by measuring the position of the, the deviation from the center of the heme laser, I can see what sort of forces are acting on my particle. So characterization of the trap, we can look at uh, how, the, how the beams look like when they impart on the particle. So here I have uh, beam propagation in positive Z direction and some sort of convergence angle of 60, I assume, and then I calculate how my uh, fields will look like when the particle is slightly below the focus or to the right of the focus. And you can see that the particle basically works as a lens, and so basically here we see the, the, the field being uh, uh, sent in a certain direction, and we can see what's happening here as well, and the particle will be drawn to the most intense part of the beam. We can model optical tweezers, and it is, allows us to uh, simulate for a variety of conditions. Typical parameters are the refractive index and the radius of the particle, and we have codes. We actually have um, on our web page uh, codes which uh, you can use. We call it optical uh, toolbox, and you can calculate uh, fields and uh, forces uh, for any particles within the parameters you want. And we can then decide on and uh, uh, look at the trapping parameters, uh, landscapes. So what I what I plot here is I have uh, I use this optical toolbox in order to uh, look at how uh, the trapping landscape will look for particles of different sizes with different refractive indices. So whatever is red here in this picture will be able to trap particles very easily. What's blue means that the forces are very, very tiny, and of course there's no trapping there at all. And what you can see here is that we have resonant effects, like interference effects here. And uh, you can see that for particle with, uh, with uh, very high refractive index, like for example diamond, I can trap it when the particle is very little, but uh, it's very narrow of space where I can trap <coughs> such uh, particles with such very high refractive index. However, if we're talking about polystyrene beads or biological cells or whatever, you can see that we can trap them within the very large uh, region of sizes. So we can go, so this is uh, in microns, mm -hmm. so you can see that we can go to much higher. <coughs> Why do you have this periodicity? Well, because you have interference effects occurring oh. here. That, that will cost that. So is this modeled for 1064? 1064. But you can do it for any uh, lambda. Uh, I mean, the, the, the code will work equally well if it's visible light or even much redder light. We do it for 1064 because we want to use tweezers for being able to manipulate biological samples. Okay. So here, uh, um, this is in Z direction, so the forces are slightly weaker in Z direction when you trap particles. So forces in X and Y are much stronger, in Z are much weaker, so we just model it. And it's very similar calculation here, and you can see that it's this periodicity here occurs as well. It's slightly different, but, but similar in the, in the forces, as I said, are just slightly different. Okay. So uh, if I want to do force measurements, I can do the following thing. I can take my laser and trap the particle. So I imagine that this is my trap. I, I, I find the particle in the, in, in the trap, and then I uh, uh, look at the escape force. So I drag the particle with stronger and stronger force till it escapes, and I measure the escape, escape force. So I can move stage. I can also calibrate the force, um, uh, force calibration of the detector signal by position sensitive detector. So this is the quadrant detector that I showed you. And viscous drag applies no force, of, obviously. I can also measure uh, position by, uh, and trap stiffness by using Brownian motion uh, and do uh, position calibration that way. So this is what I showed you uh, originally in one of the previous slides that I can now look at the stiffness uh, in dependence on uh, depending on power here. So this is very weak trap, and this is much stronger trap. And what you can see that we have this follow of uh, one of the F two, 
uh, which is characteristic for the trap, uh, uh, for the optical trapping. And you can see that the force here, uh, the stiffness is, is uh, very weak and it's much, much stronger here. So by changing the power, um, uh, a factor of, what is it, um, uh, 100 or so, you can see that we can make the trap much stiffer. And of course, if you, if you, if, if, if you have any deviations from that, well, then you're in, in trouble, but you can maybe calculate something very, very much more interesting. Okay, so here I'm looking at the position calibration. So I have two micron polystyrene sphere, and I scan over the detector range. And you can see that I can see the uh, normalized signal in y direction and in x direction. In actual fact, two, what is it, three uh, talks prior to mine, uh, those forces have been shown by the other speaker. Okay, so now um, in the last couple of weeks, one of my students has been interested in the following situation. Imagine now that instead of having one trap, you have two traps, okay? And now, if you start off with having the traps on top of each other, and you have one part of oil out. And then what you do is you, you move the traps uh, side by side, and you make the, the distance between the traps bigger and bigger. And then the question we're asking ourselves is, what happens to the part of oil? Does it stay in one of the wells? Or does it, at certain geometry between the traps, start jumping between them? And in fact, we got interested in it a little bit too late because people beat us to it and published it in Nature, actually, a few years ago. But we thought we would calculate it anyway. Okay. And so, and so this is what we are starting to do here. So basically, I'm saying I have two traps, and if there is no separation between the traps, so the traps are on top of each other. And then what I do is I'm looking at what, what, how, how the trap is looking like with the particle in it. So the particle is here in the middle of the trap. Okay, and the particle has two sizes, 0.5 wavelength of light and 1.5 wavelength of light. And we can see this is one trap, they, they look slightly differently because one is, uh, the particle in, in one is three times bigger than the other, so the fields have to look different, but we have our traps here. So we can model that. And then, this is the situation which occurs for these two sizes of the particles. Uh, so I have, uh, sorry, one size of the part, two sizes of the particle, but the beams are uh, uh, just after separation. So they are uh, uh, 1.33 wavelength apart. So we can see that we can, uh, th there are two, it's a rather unstable situation here, we can see that the, that the, the, the particle can be sort of trapped in those little eyes of the, of the uh, picture, or, but it, in unstable, it will probably move between those two, two, uh, two positions. And so separation between the beams slightly bigger here, and you can see what's happening here as well, that the particle, if it, it will be pushed by the beam to this position, but then might actually go into the minimum on the side, and then might start oscillating positions. Whether it will actually jump between the traps, it's uh, not certain. So it's very, what it shows is that it's very sensitive to the situation with uh, jumping between the two traps, will be very uh, sensitive to the size of the particle uh, and, uh, and the separation between the traps. So here is a little um, animation <coughs> of the situation um, where we are moving the traps apart. So we started with the traps together, and here we are moving them apart, till we come to the pictures that I was showing you before. And again, if we go further, traps are about to separate, so we choose one of those positions and look at it a little bit more. And what I want to show you here is I want you to look at this place here where the particle will be drawn in, and then it will probably go either one way or the other way, it won't be determined which way it will go, and then it might oscillate between those because I'll be showing it to you a little bit later. So here we go again. No, it's not. Here we go. And it stopped. And you can see that when we are moving them, separate, separate them, that this, this little 
blip appears in the middle where the particle will probably go. Okay, so here is this, the situation. <coughs> Again. And now I start this one. And this is what happens. So the particle is sort of swapping between this position to this and then back again and back again and back again. But it does not jump. For this particular size, this particular um, um, diameter and, and, and the wavelength of light, it didn't jump between the drugs. So it was just swapping. Okay, so I thought it was pretty interesting to show you, although we don't have exciting results with them oscillating between the two traps, but the calculations sort of confirm what we were seeing experimentally. So now just a few applications of optical tweezers. So um, as I said, we are trapped. I don't know whether you'll be able to see anything on this. Well, what it's supposed to show, there is a, there is a cell, macrophage, and we are trapping this macrophage with optical tweezers and we can move it around the entire cell, which is about 10 microns in size. So let's go to the next one because we can't see anything. So what we have done here, sorry, I'm being a little too eager here. What we have done here is that we have trapped a chloroplast in a cell, in a living cell, and, uh, and uh, what we now are doing is that we're taking one of the chloroplasts and we are moving it around. So this chloroplast, what, what you might ask why we did it, but that's a separate story, but basically we're displacing chloroplast inside living cell using the tweezers, and um, chloroplast is detached from its neighbors, and, uh, and we can follow the movement of the chloroplast. What we wanted to do, that was a long time ago, and we wanted, there was a question that our friends were asking about the shape of the chloroplast, uh, whether, what, what sort of shape the chloroplast is, and we were able to look at it from different directions and be able to establish it. It's um, shape that way by using optical tweezers. Now, optical traps have been very successfully used in uh, cancer diagnostics, and in fact, um, two groups, one in Germany, one in UK, have done a lot of experiments with this uh, with this technique. This is a little bit different to the optical tweezers that I was describing to you before, because here what we have is that there is optical single mode optical fiber and are two fibers, and they are aligned with each other so that the trap which is built is in the middle here. So it's only two-dimensional trap. It doesn't trap in three dimensions. However, if the, if the blood cell or particle comes into, the, into this region, it will be trapped in this region. Now, what has been done with it is that um, you can disbalance the forces in the trap, and therefore, if you have elastic, uh, uh, elastic object in the trap, which the blood cell is, then you can stretch it. And when you stretch it, you measure the forces and you can establish elasticity of the cell. So the idea there was that if the cell is um, a cancer cell, if the blood cell, uh, red blood cell is uh, uh, coming from a patient with uh, cancer, then the elasticity of that cell is very different to the non-cancer cell. Okay, and uh, that has been measured and um, in, in, the, in the trials it has shown to have, uh, it was compared with the results done otherwise and the comparison was very good. So you can see how it's done, so the particle comes in um, and uh, in, in the flow, so this is microfluidic device, and the particle comes into the stretcher tweezers and is being stretched with certain uh, force and then uh, you, you can see that it changes the, the uh, dimensions and you can measure how much it has, uh, how, what's the elasticity of the cell. Now you can also uh, do funky things like this with a stretcher. Uh, so there's basically my optical fiber, you can see the core of the fiber, I hope you can see it. And uh, if I'm changing the power between those beams, I can make the particle travel back and forth between and then I can take, instead of waiting for the particle to come, I can use it with optical tweezers. So here I'm bringing particles using optical tweezers. And we can see what happens here. We can collect particles all along this, this gap between the, 
the fibers. And now, by changing the force between the uh, between these two fibers, uh, we can make the particles move around. And then you can separate them and uh, have a quite well-defined separation between them. So that's another thing now. I don't know what happened there. Okay. The other thing you, we can do, we can use holographic tweezers so there is no... Uh, no uh, reason to believe that we can only have two tweezers. We can have quite a number of tweezers using uh, spatial light modulators, for example, or holographically done um, um, gratings or whatever you want to use. But if you want to have a freedom of uh, manipulating the traps, a spatial light modulator is the way to go. So this is work done in Max Paget's group. And here we have diamond structure, and then he will make line out of those uh, trap patterns here. So I'll show you that. Okay, so this is the diamond structure. What it shows is basically that you have incredible freedom in manipulating particles in three dimensions. So this is reorganizing the crystal. And here, that's building the line. And of course, a lot of work on holographic tweezers is done in, in Ivan's lab and in many labs around the world haptic tweezers and so on and so forth. And you can manipulate it very easily by changing the structure. And if you want to look at really funky things, then go onto Miles Paget's uh, webpage and uh, you can observe Scottish dance uh, down the top. <laughs> That's quite good fun. Okay, so this is just flexibility of tweezers really, which we see here. And um, there was a lot of work done with um, um, laser <coughs> scissors as well. And a uh, very beautiful part of the work was done on uh, chromosomes in the lab of Michael Burns. And um, this particular experiment has actually never been done. But this was his uh, uh, vivid imagination of what you could do with optical tweezers. So basically what he has shown is that um, he could inactivate uh, chromosomes by using laser uh, scissors. So the idea of laser scissors now is you have highly focused laser light, but this time you take the light like <coughs> what the previous speaker was using, which is absorbed by, absorbed by the sample that you are illuminating. So I take blue laser, which will be absorbed by a, by, by a chromosome, so I'll kill the chromosome basically. And what uh, Michael Burns was able to show is that if he had a cell in which he killed that chromosome, then when the cell was dividing, that chromosome well, wasn't there. No, no trace of the chromosome was there. So now the idea is that I can use my infrared laser, immobilize the cell, then take blue laser and punch a hole in the membrane, and then I can input, uh, use the optical tweezers to get a, um, a chromosome from somewhere else, which is not, uh, which is good chromosome instead of being diseased, and uh, uh, unhappy chromosome, and put it into the cell. And obviously, the the membrane of the cell will close on itself, and will now the idea is that, of course, if I have inputted this fabulous chromosome into the cell, when the cell then divides, the, the, it divides with having that chromosome inside. Okay, the other thing people have done with using optical tweezers is cell fusion. So I have two cells here. I put my uh, laser, tweez laser scissors here, so absorption occurs. I punch a hole in two membranes, the, the cells fuse, and you can see we do have one cell. Another thing that has been done uh, uh, in the Karin Schutze and Michael Burns is that uh, it has been shown that um, you can um, s um, stop sperm motility by taking the, so the, the, the uh, sperm is being caught in optical tweezers and then you cut its tail using uh, optical scissors. What is it good for? People, they, this, people have shown that you can do in vitro fertilization not by cutting tails of the sperms, but actually bringing the, bringing sperm very close to the egg, punching the hole in the 
membrane, double membrane of the egg, and inputting the sperm into the uh, into the egg. And uh, it has been shown that it, it has the, the, any manipulation with the lasers didn't destroy the cell at all. Okay. The, the, the system at all and then the system was developing. We can also study dynamics, dynamic structures of individual nucleosomes and this is very nice work done by um, these people here and it was published some time ago and there's a lot of work like that going on in the lab of um, now his name escapes but anyway the idea here is something like this that you can have your cover slip with DNA on it and on the other, uh, other end of the DNA, you can put microsphere. Now, this microsphere can be trapped in optical tweezers, and then by stretching the, uh, the nucleosome, uh, we can measure what sort of forces we apply here. Um, and so, um, uh, by stretching the chromosome RS with feedback control, we can, we can measure what sort of forces uh, uh, occur here, and the steps down to, I think, two ohmstrom or five ohmstrom have been measured for this RNA system. Now, we have done a little bit of work on um, macrophage sphere adhesion. So, um, you might ask why we did it, not only because we could, but there was actually a, a, a sort of biological problem here. So, we had colleagues in the Department of um, Anatomy who have uh, been doing a lot of um, uh, artificial arteries. So they were producing artificial arteries uh, in the following way. They were taking a, a plastic material, so this is a piece of plastic material like this, except that this is a, a quite a big tube. The tube was inoperated into perineal cavity of an animal, a uh, dog for example, and then two weeks later uh, it was out-operated in. So what happened in the two weeks was that the, around the um, plastic, there, was the, the, there were cells being built uh, around it. And the question, that, and what they were able to do is to get this plastic tube out and then pull the constructed <coughs> structure inside out and have a, um, a, a, a very good uh, piece of um, uh, artery which was then inoperated into the animal. And the, why it was good was because it was uh, no rejection by the system of the animal because it was grown in, by its own cells. So then they wanted to study a little bit uh, details of adhesion so that the process could be made faster, if possible. So the question there was, what is the onset, what is the um, adhesion uh, force here? and what is the best material to be used. So this is what we uh, try to do. So we, we have this uh, macrophage here, and um, it's on the microscope slide, and then we have trapped particle here. And you can see that when I um, go away with the macrophage from this particle, there is um, a certain moment where the particle is still attached to it, so I'm stretching the bond, and then eventually when I pull further, you can see it here, it, it sort of moves in and out of the trap. And I can measure how much it moves in and out of the trap and therefore measure the force. So the model looks something like this. I have my particle, um, uh, my macrophage, and the particle trapped in the, in the, in the trap. And then um, I uh, um, see the adhesion occurring. And then I pull further and the bond is breaking. So uh, I can measure the rupture force of this bond, if it's one bond or many bonds. And the system looks something like this. Again, it's, it's very similar to the system that I showed you before. So here I want to measure very uh, carefully the position of the particle uh, when it's uh, uh, disattaching from the macrophage. And I do it by having this extra uh, laser here where I can look at the, my QPD and determine the position of it. So here it kind of looks, if I have no adhesion, I'm coming to the, this is in time, I'm coming towards the, uh, the macrophage, nothing happens, and then, well, there's a little bit of um, a sphere displacement, but uh, no, if, if I go away, you can see that the, 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 the 
I get to the same level uh, as I had before. Now, if the adhesion, however, takes place, then this is what happens. I stretch the bond, it breaks, and it comes back again. And I can measure what it means, and I can give it a number. And uh, so I'm touching here, I'm going away. There is some sort of oscillation here. I can measure each bit of it, and I can determine the forces. So here are the points, so stretching, and I can measure the stiffness here. I can measure the stiffness everywhere else. And rupture force can be measured in the numbers. OK. Um, uh, and so now what I would like to do, do I have to have a break now? Or is it still time? Ten more minutes. Okay. So, okay. So now, what I want to do. So, in all those experiments that I was showing you, applications that I was showing you now, we were using transfer of linear momentum of light to my particles, which were trapped, and then I was stretching it or whatever I was doing, whether I was using to me I was measuring the, the, the linear transfer. However, if I want to do rotational tweezers, what I want to do is to be able to put the particle in some sort of a beam which will make it rotate. So there are several methods of doing it. We can have asymmetric particles in laser beam and they will rotate. I can have spaceships, especially formed laser beams that I mentioned to you, which carry orbital angular momentum. And I can have multiple traps. You can imagine that I can have multiple traps and, and, and some sort of an object and apply uh, this um, forces which are unequal in two of them and therefore rotate the particle. That way. So here are examples of rotation. So this is a uh, calcite crystal grown in the lab, which can be made rotating. Not that you can use it for anything, but it looks quite pretty. You can have elongated particle. Can you see that? This is elongated particle here. It's a shard of uh, uh, glass, which is rotated in, in calcium beam. And then Are I you can, using polarization? Or? Yes, I'm using here. Yes, uh, I'm using the fact that if I have a Gaussian beam which is impinging on a elongated particle, I, ha I will have polarizability in x and y being different, and therefore I will create uh, a torque that way. And here, what I'm using is I'm having circularly polarized light, and I have particle which is biofringing and it's being rotated. And here, and I'll tell you a little bit about everything <coughs> of that sort, here I have a laser beam which has orbital angular momentum and elongated particle. And you can see it's a dumbbell, basically, and I can rotate it pretty fast. So these are all different methods for rotation. So I can use spin angular momentum, I can use orbital angular momentum, and I can uh, use um, Gaussian beam and, and the elongated particles so I can induce uh, polarization, different polarization in X and Y direction. So as I said, what the aim of it is to twist and turn as well as push and pull. And uh, I want to do it by known amount, so I want to measure optical torque and use spin, orbital, momentum of light. Okay, so spin is acting on biofringing particles, orbital or helical wavefronts are acting on non axisymmetric objects, and then I can do all the calculations with that using my optical toolbox. Okay, so here is the summary of what I said up to now, that I have spin angular momentum. What I'm looking at is basically the fact, so this is my electromagnetic uh, field, and uh, I have now plus or minus h-bar kilofarton uh, of uh, spin angular momentum. So it's either left-handed or right-handed uh, circularly polarized line. Okay, and I can have orbital angular momentum, okay, and I will then have plus minus L H bar per photon of orbital angular momentum if I have fancy laser beams like this. And then of course I can combine the two because this type of laser beam can also be circularly polarized. Okay? So, circularly polarized laser beam. So, um, uh, now the first thing we'll look at is spin angular momentum. So, this was uh, 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 
the idea of being able to rotate things using spin angular momentum is really very old. It's 1939 or 36, I can't quite remember, when Betts uh, did his original experiment. So he had a torsion pendulum, this is how he did it. He had a torsion pendulum, he had aluminum uh, layer here, and uh, he put the light through it, and he had lambda over four plate here, and then uh, lambda over two plate and another lambda over four plate. And he looked at, and we cannot see here my reflected light, but there is light being reflected back and forth. So if we pass circularly polarized light twice through lambda over two plate, uh, 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 and those lambda over two plates are suspended in a torsion pendulum, a potential fiber, we achieve then four h bar per photon of angular, uh, angular momentum. So it was an incredibly difficult experiment, but it did show transfer of spin angular momentum. So then we came along, um, some years later at least, and decided that uh, we could do, by sheer accident actually, the first experiment was done, but what we have done is we have calcium carbonate particle in water, and of course we can trap such a particle in water, so here's the particle, um, and I'm using polarized light. So if I trap the particle, so here is my plain polarized light, it goes either through lambda over two plate or lambda over four plate, I have high numerical aperture objective which I need for my trapping. Okay, so I either rotate the particle continuously or align to a particular orientation. So if I have linearly polarized light, the orientation is controllable because I have some sort of optical axis here and the particle will follow uh, the orientation of that. I, have, I can have elliptical light and the rotation frequency is controllable. Okay, so uh, let us see what we, we can do. So this is shard of calcium carbonate, very large particle and very flat. And what we are doing here is we are changing the lamp, we rotating lambda over two plate, and the particle is following that rotation. So that means that if I wanted to have continuous rotation, I would put my lambda over two particle on a motor and mm -hmm. rotate it that way. But what's interesting here is that I can rotate it to my liking, and it will follow the the direction of the of the lambda over two plate. So that's one. Uh, now I can take this shell of, of calcium carbonate by fringing particle, and I can now use a circularly polarized light, and I can rotate it. You can see that this particular film, it's an old film now, uh, it, it, the rotation wasn't very fast, and it was due to the fact that this particle is about 10 microns in size, and it's rather heavy. And so it's not very strongly trapped, so it catches microscope slide underneath and it sort of jiggles back and forth a little bit. Okay, so so what is it based upon? Is shall I break now? Yeah. We'll Maybe I will break now so people can questions? I just want to have a look at your uh, setup on the very first slides. Sure. Maybe the later Okay. Mm -hmm. Very first slide. Yeah, not the very first, maybe very the second. No, like um, this is a picture, but the cartoon, the cartoon, cartoon where you put um, quadrant the detector and uh, the vertical. Oh, oh, I see what you mean. Okay, when we measure forces, I think mm -hmm. right. No, the we before the forces at the introduction. One? I think it is that one. Ah, yes. Okay, here it is. Okay? <coughs> what is this detector D1? Well, you might split a little bit of light to be able to uh, follow the stability of the laser. Ah. That's the only thing. So this is just a few percent of light going to the detector. So you can have also feedback control. So this is the trapping arm, yep. but you're also controlling all the power system. This is the, this are gimbal like, uh, mounted mirror, so you can move the particle uh, yes, in two directions. Yes, and then this part is for detection. Detection of, uh, you measure the stiffness force? Uh, whatever you want to measure, position, mm -hmm. stiffness, whatever you're doing. So in, in a lot of groups, people do not use the 
King laser at all, because you can do the same thing by looking at the particle movement by using just the light from this laser. But you need to put a high-speed camera. Not necessarily. You can do it with high-speed camera, and it's a very nice part, and I won't talk about it, but we are about to do it, and a lot of groups are doing it. But basically, you have scattered light from this laser as well. So you, and you, can, you can project the particle on your QPD using that laser as well. And then you can see how it moves. Ah, so we don't need helium, we can use Well, the... well, I think you do, uh -huh. but there is a lot of discussion about it. I think that if they are independent and this particle, this laser is not used for trapping, uh -huh. you can see that the precision of, of the measurement according to us can be done better. What is this? Uh, it, it, it's just a computer uh, control of the stage. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay, one more question. In, in the beginning, you discussed two limiting cases where the, the particle is much smaller than lambda or much larger. But in some of the experiments, it seems like it's about the same as lambda. Exactly. So does that cause... Thank problems? you. Uh, <laughs> no, so this is actually quite surprising stuff because you are absolutely right that in majority of experiments where you do trapping, they neither in neither regime. And so we do proper calculations using FDDT but, and uh, dipole approximation and so on. But in principle, you can show that if you use ray optics calculations, in 90% of cases, it's enough. Um, but if you really want to do precise measurements, then, then you have to do proper, so maximum equation. And of course, if they are very small, then your dipole approximation is very good. More questions? Uh, if not, let us uh, have a break and reconvene in five minutes.